Okay, thanks everyone for coming out. It's, I really, we really appreciate it. Um, this is put on by uh, the Progressive Alliance, it's a grassroots uh, organization in Keene, centered, and, uh, and also Rights and Democracy, which is a state group. So Rights and Democracy New Hampshire, also part of Rights and Democracy uh, Vermont, another grassroots group. And uh, also Keene State College, Kim over here has been great helping and all the tech people. And then we have a really, really good panel. Really, you're gonna learn a lot tonight. And um, also here we are. And then Dottie Morris and who, who knows Dottie Morris? Dottie? Okay, I hope to say a lot. But, uh, uh, Dottie's going to be the moderator, and she's Associate Vice President for Institutional Diversity and Equality, Equity at Keene State College, and um, we'll get on and on about her, but uh, she, she's wonderful. And I think there's a bio sheet that it has information on everyone, so we won't go into all the details. But we're going to start out with Carl DiMatteo, and Carl is a physician uh, from um, this area. And uh, he's also the chairman of the Democratic, uh, Cheshire Democrats. And uh, anyway, here you go. Can everyone hear me? I'm pretty good at projecting. Yeah. What? No, the TV wants you to. Oh. You can hold the mic if you want. Oh, all right. <laughs> I feel like I'm back. Um, this doesn't work well for me. Does this work over here? Can you hear me now? No. Yes. All right. Thank you all. Um, my name is, as he said, I'm Carl DiMatteo. I'm an internist and infectious disease specialist. I've been caring for patients for 44 years, and about 35 of them in Keene and in other parts of New Hampshire. Uh, I'm somewhat retired now, but I see patients in Winchester uh, on a regular basis, just starting this week, in fact, and it's been wonderful. Uh, this may sound tangential, but uh, just before Christmas, I was reading a book uh, by Christopher Moore, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with Christopher Moore. It's called The Stupidest Angel, and he tends to get kind of flight of fancy. Uh, but I was struck, in this uh, book, there was, uh, uh, they were preparing for a Christmas event, and uh, uh, one of the characters kept saying, oh, I do hope they sing Good King Wenceslas. And another character who was rather curmudgeonly said, no one knows the words to that. They're not going to sing it, you know. And several times in the, in the narrative, they kept saying that. And I go, gee, do I know all the words? To go? You know, I know the first part, you know, Feast of Stephen and, you know, St. Agnes Fountain maybe. But so I actually Googled uh, the uh, words and uh, I was really captivated, not by most of the words, but the last words. And maybe you know this, but the last words are, ye who now shall bless the poor, shall yourself find blessing. And that just really stuck with me. Um, because for the past year, I've been volunteering with an organization called Remote Area Medical. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. But uh, they're a group that works with local sponsors, and they will uh, bring uh, people in facilities to provide free medical care, dental care, vision care, including free glasses, free dentures, uh, over a weekend period of time. They've been highlighted on a number of news uh, casts recently in the Times and in uh, uh, 60 Minutes. But um, I've seen hundreds of people line up in the cold and the rain 16 to 18 hours before the doors open just to get their chance. Uh, and a sizable percentage of these people, you know, that I see there have jobs. They even have insurance. Many of them have Medicare. But they still cannot afford their health care. This is, you know, this just struck me as being, you know, not right. And, uh, so this January, I was serving at a clinic in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I saw a really lovely woman. She was a Congregationalist minister, and she had taken a leave of absence uh, to care for her mother who was dying. She, her uh, 
congregation was in New York, but she was down in Knoxville where her mother was. And she came uh, and said, I'm nearly out of my medications and I don't have insurance and I, you know, I don't know what to do. She had diabetes and high blood pressure. She uh, was, I said, well, how are you dealing with this? She said, well, I'm taking the pills twice a week to make them last longer. Uh, and it just doesn't work that way. So I examined her and uh, talked with her. And afterwards, I was able to find her a pharmacy that could provide uh, prescriptions for her for about $16, which she could actually afford. And then and the moment struck me. She stood up to go. She gave me a big hug. And she said, I must bless you. And uh, because I felt like, gee, you know, I came to bless the poor. And uh, I found blessing. And that really meant a lot to me. It should mean a lot more to us as a society. Um, as an infectious disease specialist, I always thought I would go overseas and maybe deliver care in a third world country, maybe see some exotic infections and help people. Working in the past year, I've done it about five times with remote area medical, I realized I don't have to leave the United States to practice third world health care. I can get it right here in the United States. That is pathetic, given the resources available to us in this country. While working in Keene and around the rest of the country, I have found that people with jobs and without jobs, with insurance and without insurance, can't afford their care. And any of us who may be pretty well off, I'm not doing bad, uh, a catastrophic illness could wipe most of us out. In fact, that's the leading cause of bankruptcy in this country right now, is catastrophic medical illness. So just to sum summate, um, I firmly believe that neither America nor any country can be great if its people are sick and poorly educated. And I fear that's a position we are drifting further and further to every year. And we should bless the poor because we're amongst them. But what America does is curse the poor. And I believe ourselves to be a curse for that. We need to have provide health care coverage, which includes preventive, acute, chronic, behavioral health care, dental care, which is totally unaddressed, uh, and behavioral health care. The following speakers who know a lot more about doing this than me will provide a lot of information and strategies to you all. And hopefully help us achieve the blessing that America should deserve. Thank you. Carl, that was uh, terrific. I think many of us are here tonight because of our interest. Ah. So I, I think many of us are here tonight because we recognize the moral imperative, the necessity for health care for our fellow citizen. I was actually asked to speak tonight about some of the finances or aspects of financial components of Medicare for All. So uh, that will be uh, the, this topic. How many of you are students or medical uh, or uh, college students? Terrific. So uh, there may be some terminology, which will be great if you're taking a, a, this as part of a course. And um, I think that we'll have time for questioning at the end uh, and, uh, as we touch on these issues. So. Many of us already know what the polls and surveys have shown, which is that uh, health care financing remains at the top of the list for Americans' worries when it comes to uh, cost. Um, this outweighs concerns about retirement, food or housing, and it's been consistently the case uh, for this past at least decade. Almost half of your fellow New Hampshire citizens have some difficulty in paying out-of-pocket medical bills, and mostly because of climbing deductibles. 
Uh, everybody, do the students know what a deductible is, by the way? You may not be paying for your health insurance yet, but that's sort of an out-of-pocket charge before you can even get your uh, insurance company to pay for the service that you are um, purchasing, essentially. So we have here in the U.S. a perpetual American anxiety over health care security. And by the way, this is viewed as peculiar by most citizens elsewhere in the world. Uh, we talk about American exceptionalism, in which we do have some marvelous examples. This is an example of exceptionalism that other countries look at and scratch their heads and say, why are folks unable to cover their own health insurance when there are so many solutions that we'll be getting to tonight? So in the U.S., uh, overall, we spend $3.2 trillion annually for health care. What you may not know is that we are already spending two-thirds of that, $2 trillion, for actually uh, taxpayer public programs, but a whole hodgepodge of uncoordinated public programs. This includes Medicaid, Medicare, you may have heard of the Children's Health Insurance, CHIP, includes VA care, includes the, American, uh, the, the ACA, Obamacare, as well as Veterans, TRICARE. I could go on, the list is as long as my arm. This is the way that things have happened in this nation over many uh, decades. When the constellations align properly, when you have a progressive Congress, a progressive president, and the people's will, a group of Americans get covered. So children got their coverage under CHIP back in the 70s. Actually, Hillary, Hillary Clinton was instrumental in accomplishing that. Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare being for the elderly, uh, over 65, and Medicaid being for uh, folks who are below the poverty level. They both happened in unison in 1965. So each of these events have occurred, leaving us at the current time to have 28 million Americans who remain totally uninsured despite all of these uh, fingers in the dike, because we've tried to do everything but the right thing in terms of paying for health care in the U.S. So this first slide, I don't know if this has a pointer on it. Mm, yeah, look at that. So this is what Americans pay in total on a per capita annual basis for health care in the U.S. $10,000 annually by every American citizen. So what does this entail? Well, this entails, this uh, 4,000 or so dollars over here entails what comes out of people's pockets. This is paying for the premium for your health insurance, this is paying for the deductible before uh, the, the insurance even starts to cover, as well as co-pays and a variety of other issues. This is what Americans pay for public taxes, for this hodgepodge of uncoordinated multiple uh, dinghies attached to the ship of healthcare in the U.S. If you look at what, whoa, sorry, if you look at what other countries pay, um, uh oh, I goofed something up. I'm um, sorry, which direction am I going here? There we go, sorry. Uh, you see that we actually pay more with publicly taxed dollars in the U.S. than many other nations, oh, I keep doing that, many other nations are paying for their total health care. This includes that paradigm of, or the paragon of socialism, Sweden. So we actually are paying more for our health care than Sweden does and most other Scandinavian countries, by the way. Something wrong with this picture. So um, what are we getting for this? There's something called value. Students understand what value is. In the, in the area of health care, value can be defined as health outcomes per dollar spent for one's health care. Um, so um, a lot of, you've heard many politicians in years past profess we have the best health care in the world. Well, that is unfortunately no longer borne out by the data. Um, and it's also not borne out by the anecdotal experiences of many docs who are practicing and whose patients do not have health care. It still remains the case that Saudi princes and uh, folks who have good health coverage can take a veil of some remarkable advances in technology. And it's great, I'm a practicing physician, I've practiced for 35 years, I'm a geriatrician, by the way. So the, many of my, not all, but many of my patients have Medicare. What I could say is it's, del, it's marvelous to have patients be able to take a veil of modern technological advances. However, what I also know is really the linchpin of good healthcare is not the 
breaking new medical um, uh, advances. It's basic medical care that people in this country are often um, not able to take advantage of. Barriers such as cost, uh, barriers to access, insurance runarounds, lack of access to primary care docs, a major issue, uncoordinated social services and medical care far outweigh the technical advances when it comes to what is meaningful for in, in one's uh, health and in one's life. So again, we're talking about outcomes, value. What do we get for all those bucks we're paying? This is mortality amenable to healthcare. What that means is someone has a medical condition that with the proper treatment they will not die from. Someone has diabetes, take care of their diabetes, they won't prematurely die from complications from that. Coronary disease, you name it, cancer. This is all kinds of mortality that is responsive to what we can offer. And as Dr. DiMatteo mentioned, a lot of those folks lining up in those tents are going to be a statistic uh, in this chart. Uh, we do uh, poor, we are not the best as uh, the European nations are. We're at this side of things. We score poor, most poorly in that regards. Infant mortality, which is often a reflection of overall health care, it sort of reflects both prenatal care, pregnancy care, social services available to take care of that infant, uh, and a variety of other aspects. Guess where we fall? I hate to say it, but we do not f uh, serve well. We are not serving our, 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 our public well. Uh, what else do we have for outcomes? Well, we have something called performance. And performance really uh, is, uh, takes into account a variety of different aspects of health services. It would include um, things like access to care, how efficient the care is when you see your doctor, equity, does everyone have opportunity to get that same care? Timeliness, how, how rapidly can you get your heart attack taken care of? Coordination of care, patient health and satisfaction. And uh, from the organization of economic uh, and uh, of, um, cooperation and development, uh, we unfortunately uh, are down here on this end of things. This is from the Commonwealth Fund and the OECD uh, data. Um, so clearly uh, there's work to be done. Uh, this is just our healthcare performance compared to spending. No surprise, again, we're on the right side uh, of this uh, chart. And these are just individual rankings that I'll skip through. So uh, if you're interested, this is care process, access, administrative efficiency, equity, healthcare outcomes. So there are many determinants uh, of um, the value and efficiency of a healthcare system. Um, one thing that I sometimes hear folks say, well, it, isn't it because the U.S. has a different population or a smattering of different folks in different places? The answer is no, it's not because of that. If you look at um, very well-honed data, in fact, uh, we do not have a sicker population in the United States than other countries this is compared to, nor an older population. Actually, our population, though we're all getting older, is actually younger than a lot of these other nations. Um, they have a, a, a lower uh, birth rates. So citizens in other countries will actually visit their doctors more often, average of six times a year in, in many of these nations. Uh, they'll have similar, if not more, interventions for things like a hip replacement, knee replacement, bypass. It's not like they're having less surgeries that they're getting triage from having. In fact, they have a higher rate of kidney transplants than in the United States due to a variety of reasons, not just the health system. Um, and there's increased support for long-term health care in those nations as well. So it really is not due to the population. What are the factors that play a role other than uh, the issues that we'll get to in terms of financing? Well, primary care is a linchpin of high-value care. Um, in fact, there has been a relative reversal of the number of primary care docs practicing in the United States over the past 40 or 50 years. Um, in fact, there's uh, more specialists in primary care docs. Uh, and there are other um, clinicians who are filling that role, but this has been a major shift in um, the healthcare scene in the U.S. Some of this has to do with administrative hassles of physicians, by the way. That is, um, when you're a physician in, in private practice, or any practice, you're dealing with multiple insurers, multiple utilization review teams. Do students know what those are, what a utilization review? So every insurer, particularly for-profit health insurers, Cigna, um, United, Humana, these programs um, don't want to pay out dollars towards healthcare if they could avoid it, because that will increase their profit. 
They take a premium on an annual basis and they'll pay out the um, what's called medical loss in insurance parlance. That means basically paying for basic medical care from those pre premiums. These are for-profit systems. The less they pay out, the more money they'll make. Um, so in reality, each one, and there's, there's about 1,200 different insurance companies in the United States. Each insurance company may have its own bank of nurses and reviewers on the telephone telling the doctor's office, no, that's not covered, no, it has to be this diagnosis to get that particular procedure covered, et cetera. That level of administration hassle is huge. And not just that, there's drug formulary hurdles and a variety of other issues that makes uh, actually practicing primary care in the U.S. Uh, unique in the world. And in fact, uh, there's been a, a net migration of primary care docs from the U.S. to Canada, not the other way around in, in recent years. So um, primary care has been highly valued in other uh, nations. It's coming to rec be recognized uh, for the value it serves in good health care, but it has a long way to go. You know, in terms of value in health care, health care is unnecessarily complex, fragmented, and inefficient. And the Institute of Medicine has some uh, cute analogies that you might think about. So if, if having your house built, if home building were like health care, all of your carpenters, the electricians, the plumbers, each one of them would work off a different blueprint. Not just that, to be able to communicate with one another, they'd be faxing the blueprints back and forth to one another, to their offices. And they would be very little coordination or shared conception of what is this house I'm trying to build? What is it going to look like? That's, in fact, that's, that's not a bad analogy for uh, complex medical care in the US on occasion. If banking were like US healthcare, taking money out of your ATM would often take days or weeks since banks would fax pages back and forth rather than have shared computer systems. That is the reality, as you know, when you go to your doctor's office. How about shopping? If you go to the grocery store, you would never see the product prices. Uh, they wouldn't be posted. Um, and you look for the same product in a different aisle and it'll cost 10 times different. Uh, the difference will be enormous. Uh, and in fact, if you go to another uh, shopping center across the town, it'll be 100 times different. There, it'll be inscrutable about the cost of your product, and it'll depend on whether you're paying for it with a credit card or cash or a debit card. And in reality, that is what healthcare costs look like in, in, in the US. Here in New Hampshire, if you want to get an MRI of your spine, there's one freestanding center that'll cost you 305 bucks. If you go to another hospital in the north, it's going to cost you $3,300. That's a factor of 10. And this is the reality across the United States. We'll talk a little bit further about that if I have time. You know, someone's going to remind me, you want me to stop now? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I really went over. So um, I'll just share with you. <laughs> I'm glad I mentioned something. It's the first time I'm giving this talk. So, so I'll share with you that there's two factors to bear in mind. One is pricing failure. The cost of medical care in the United States is really an example of explosive, non-negotiated costs of medications and procedures. Uh, Medicare Part D is an example of that. We were talking earlier with someone where the bill was written by the pharmaceutical industry to not allow negotiation between Medicare and, the, and big pharma. Um, so pricing failure is one issue. The second issue is a wild uh, increase in administrative costs. This is drug spending. Um, this is uh, pharmaceuticals per capita. This is the growth. There's a 3,000 percent growth of administrators between 1990 and the current day. We remember we're talking about all those banks of reviewers and people who have to deal with those insurance companies. That's much of this factor. And that is considered medical waste. Waste is dollars spent on health care that does not provide benefit to patients. So much of what we are looking at from our perspectives as folks on this panel is how do we improve medical care? What I will share with you is that this issue of administration is a key component. There's the US. You can see the discrepancy between the US and all other countries. Medicare, why do, we, why, do we spend, why do we say Medicare for all versus Medicaid for all? Well, Medicare has a track record, as does Medicaid, but it takes care of our sickest people. Medicare is responsible for patients over the age of 65 or people on dialysis. 
those folks who have the most severe illness. It has managed to maintain administrative costs, uh, costs down to 3%, and it's done so with folks who are satisfied with their care and are getting excellent care. So it is a, it is a paradigm for uh, expanding uh, single payer to um, the, uh, the US and all citizens. So. My name is Marvin Malik. I'm the director of the inpatient program at Springfield Hospital over in Vermont. And my goal today is to discuss some historical issues. Um, is it, can anybody help me access slides here? So I wasn't sure how to do that. Um, OK, no goals, no takers. Um, so I wanted to go back all the way to the f uh, administration of Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. Back, can this is microphone work, by the way? Yeah. Okay. So in the 1930s, a variety of progressive legislation passed, including the Social Security Act, um, WPA, many other uh, important efforts to try to reduce poverty and deal with uh, uh, astronomical unemployment rates. And there was a major struggle back then to enact a Medicare for all program, basically a universal insurance program. There were two obstacles back then. One was that the efficacy of medicine then was so small, surgery wasn't particularly safe. Most of the medicines we currently use in almost every specialty didn't exist then. So there wasn't as much push for it at that time. In fact, hospitals were often viewed as places people go to die. So uh, the other factor that demolished that effort was the fact that by that time, the American Medical Association organized medicine, the doctors, had a very strong lobby and were very much opposed to any government involvement, feeling that they could wanted autonomy. They thought the government would be intrusive. They probably thought that they would earn less money. And so the AMA was instrumental in squashing it. And again, the effort, so much was going on. The depression, the Great Depression then was so overwhelming that many efforts were, in, were going on and it was a complex era. I mean, the growth of fascism in Europe was also diverting attention in a lot of ways. So after World War II, internationally, many, many countries that had not already done it were enacting universal health care programs. And the first of those actually was much earlier in Germany. Uh, the, uh, the Scandinavian countries had already had them. But Britain, for instance, enacted the National Health Service in 1946. And many of the countries in Europe that were recovering from the devastation of the, the great World War II, the Great War, were um, enacting universal health care. Part of the effect of war on health is horrendous. People who have gone through that kind of military conflict are often ill and injured and have many health problems. And there were really very few obstacles over in Europe and in Japan and in many other, the other developed countries to saying, OK, we have lots and lots of problems. Let's at least take care of our people if they, they're ill. That we've all gone through this horrible event. Now let's try to rebuild. And there was a sense of social solidarity. If one of our neighbors is ill or has been injured, let's just take care of them. And that was the ethos that was, had spread around the world. In the United States, under the administration of Harry Truman, after World War II ended, there was, a very, there was a huge effort to institute Medicare for all. And at that time, that might have been the peak year of the power of the American Medical Association. And they, at the same time, there was, uh, for those of you who know the history then, there were very strong communist movements throughout Western Europe. And Russia had already kind of taken over Eastern Europe 
installing puppet regimes that, that were called communist. The, what they, but anyway, they, that was the label. And so there was basically something called the Red Scare, where we were all supposed to be religiously afraid of communism. And what the American Medical Association did then was they hired, they uh, financed the most well-paid advertising campaign that the United States had ever seen prior to that year, 1946. Hiring the, the highest paid PR firm in the country to link the notion of Medicare for all, taking care of everyone in the population, to socialism and communism. And there, there had been several surveys for you about healthcare for all, the Medicare for all at that time. And a year before the, uh, that public relations campaign, 75% of the population supported Medicare for all, bringing everyone into our own healthcare system, covering all I injuries, illness, whatever came up, like all the other countries were doing. By the end of the PR campaign, that percentage was down to 21%. And that was one of the purest and finest examples of the effect of propaganda on affecting uh, public attitudes and opinions. Very depressing, really, because all the other countries were not exactly becoming fascist, communist states. They were just taking care of their people. Then in 1965, there was a once again a progressive coalition that had uh, take, that had assumed power in the United States after the death of John the assassination of John F. Kennedy. There was people were horrified at that, and and even though John F. Kennedy's policies were on the domestic side, were he hadn't really done very much, and he hadn't even built up much of a coalition for very mu very much reform. He gave people the sense that we could do better as a country and that the United States could be, could be great, could take care of our people in many, many ways. And Lyndon Baines Johnson, a far less charismatic figure, but a much shrewder politician, wanted to move forward with progressive legislation in many areas, cleaning up the environment, doing more to take care of children, dealing with childhood poverty and many other issues. And what happened is, by then, the AMA was still strong, and the insurance companies, by then, had become much stronger than was the case in the earlier efforts at reform. And so, at that time, the union movement in the United States w was pretty much at its peak. It was, after that, it was set to lose more and more power, as it has unfortunately steadily occurred since that time. And the importance of the union movement in understanding this history is that the union movement insisted on health coverage for their employees and provided fairly good health coverage. Substantial portions of the country were unionized. Those employers which were not unionized often tried to prevent unionization by providing good benefits also, kind of a side effect of a strong union movement. So what I'm getting at is that many of the population under 65 had reasonably, age 65, had reasonably good coverage, health coverage at the time, through their employment. So, and, so you sat there with the insurance industry, providing coverage for workers, those say between age 21 and 65, and their families, their children. And you have the insurance industry looking at the situation, saying, OK, we've got all these elderly people who don't have health care because they're no longer working. And we've got all these young people who pretty much won't make a lot of noise. The people who didn't have health insurance then tended to be poor. And poor people tend to not make a lot of political noise. So. What happened is the insurance industry said, OK, well, there's a big push to deal with poverty among elderly people. And a big cause for that, of that poverty is health care costs. Because as people age, get over age 65, and gets worse as you get older in terms of 
uh, health, overall health status. So those people need lots of health care. So they needed lots of health care. Everyone knew it. And the insurance industry said, well, OK, let's have the government do that. They're really expensive. And we'll take care of all the healthy people. You know how much it costs to take care of healthy people when you're, in, when you're an insurance company? I've had, I've had years and years in my life go by where I, frankly, didn't go to a doctor. I'm not saying advocating that, but that's <laughs> happened. And when most people over age 75 and 80 don't have that luxury. There's more issues going on in their lives in, in terms of their health. So the insurance industry picked off the healthy people, the young people, and said, OK, fine, we'll take care of them, or at least not have the government get too involved. And we'll let the government take care of the expensive people. So Medicare, as, as Ken pointed out, Medicare covered the elderly. And they covered people who are on dialysis. They covered people who are blind, who tend to have more health care costs. And they, they took care of the disabled, who have high health care costs, and left the healthy people for the private insurance companies to make money from. Since then, with the rise of the political right wing in this country, the insurance companies have become bolder and gained power. In fact, their power gain is pretty much at the expense of doctors who are now disunited because so many doctors now are progressive and believe in single payer health care. So doctors are no longer a united front against progressive health reform. And you should all be aware of that if you're going to fight for progressive reform. You can get doctor, a lot of doctors on your side. Take advantage of that. You want them. Trust me on that. Because you're not going to get the insurance companies on your side. You're not going to get the pharmaceutical industry on your side. Trust me on that, too. So, what, so you've got the situation where now, in the 1980s, they had the rise of the Republican Party and the political right in the United States. So now they said, well, our markets have stopped expanding. How can we make even more money? So at that point, they say, OK, well, there's all these old people on Medicare. Maybe we can find a way to pick off the healthier elderly people, get the government to cover them, um, and we'll cover them, and let the government take all the really sick people. So that leads to the privatization of the attempt to privatize the Medicare program. And that leads to a really big struggle about whether we're going to let private, the private sector insurance companies make more and more profit at the expense, basically, of the taxpayers. So the kinds of policies the private insurance companies use is they provide really good benefits for fitness centers. They provide hearing aids, coverage for hearing aids and glasses. But if you're disabled or in a nursing home, they're fleeing from you. So that's the structure, the strategies that the insurance industry uses to always picking off the healthiest people. And what's gone on since then is that we now have a period where we're about to have the rise of progressive forces in the United States. And I think we need to look very carefully at what kinds of reform we want to institute as the progressive forces assume power. I'm told I'm running out of time, so I'm going to explain later, if you ask, why we're about to enter a progressive phase in the country. But I'm over time, and I'm going to say one more thing, is that when you propose something, make it something you're proud of, and something that ever is going to appeal to everyone. And all these half-baked, I was going to say half-something else, all these half-reforms, are, do not appeal to everyone, and they don't gain public support. And they're not going to spearhead a progressive movement. And I think Obamacare was a great example of that. So let's support something that we all can be proud of. Just the way you'd want a nurse and a doctor when you, if you're ill and you're very sick and you're in the hospital to say, I will take care of you. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about the cost. Don't worry about the mess you might make if you're sick or your secretions are getting bad. Don't worry about that. We will take care of you. And that's what we want the healthcare system to do for every citizen of the country.
Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Valinsky, and I promise I will not talk about secretions. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm your executive counselor. I represent District 2, which is a badly gerrymandered district that runs from Rochester, Dover to Concord to Keene. At one point, they tried to put Brattleboro in it, but somebody <laughs> clued them in. Um, does anyone know what the Executive Council does? What's the state? Well, I wish. Uh, there are five of us. Uh, I'm sorry? That's, that's right. We watch the money. So the five members of the Executive Council act as a board of directors for the state. Um, I'm not in a political body that makes the law. Uh, we're in the executive branch and we watch how it's spent. So every contract over $25,000, for example, has to be approved by a majority of the executive council or the contract doesn't get executed. So in that way, I encounter health care in New Hampshire. Um, listen, we're all here because we have the courage to point out that the current system is failing and the courage to demand more from our political leaders. That and some professors told you you had to come tonight. Um, yeah, I see some head shakes for that. So when I think of for-profit insurers, I think of for-profit insurers are designed to avoid doing what they're designed to do, right? So the more complicated they make it, the harder it is to access benefits. The more expensive they are, the fewer people can access benefits. That, and we're in a system that's tied to employer-based insurance, um, which means that your mobility in today's economy is tied to your ability to move from job one to job two to job three. And as we become more and more mobile and want to take on different challenges, to avoid the trap of being stuck in a job that's not allowing you to advance, whether or not we can access health care outside of our current employer becomes more and more important. What I thought I would do tonight is give you um, some detailed facts. Um, you, you already have a great background of how uh, health care uh, is paid for in the US. I want to give you some local facts. Um, I want to give you some ideas that you should consider, not necessarily because they're the ones to be pursued, but to get you thinking about ways to address this problem. Healthcare for all, Medicare for all, is largely a federal issue. Um, it's a big picture issue. Um, but there are opportunities for states to get what are called waivers, um, which allow states to become places to experiment, to conduct pilot programs. They, they have to be justified, they have to be safe, they have to make economic sense, um, except for the ones that are being proposed now. Um, but it gives us opportunities, and in a small state like New Hampshire, can give us an advantage. So one idea um, that I want you to think about is we have about 800,000 uh, commercially insured people in the state. They're the people who get their insurance through their private employers. We have 80,000 public employees who are in a what's called a self-insurance system. That means that the local government or the state government or the county government is paying the benefits as they come due, as they become necessary, and they hire someone to administer the plan. The problem is that we have, in essence, three different plans in New Hampshire. We have the state employees, we have the municipal county employees, and then we have the university employees. So Keene State employees are in with the universities. 
employees. Each of them has their own administrator. Um, most of them have very similar benefits. Um, most of them have good emphasis on wellness and prevention, um, but they're replicating each other in terms of administration. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be wonderful if our 80,000 self-insured public employees came together in one system that was commonly administered, that saved the costs of duplicating the administration? We already know that in self-insurance, because the government or the self-insurer pays the benefits as they come due, the balance sheet of the company is less bloated. Let me say that again. When you have a for-profit insurance company, the company has to maintain ballast because you pay them a premium and they agree to cover all covered benefits, whether they're bigger than they expect or less than they expect. So they hold extra money. It's kind of like a, a skinny sailing ship with a deep keel to, to keep from tipping over versus a wide ship that doesn't need the keel. You're paying for the keel. In self-insurance plans, you have a much smaller ballast that's necessary, and so the premiums are less, and often the benefits are richer. So in New Hampshire, you saw the statistic nationally, it's about $4,000 is paid in premiums for uh, commercial insurance. Uh, that's similar in New Hampshire, plus you pay on average about 1,000 out of pocket. 1,000 out of pocket for deductible, uncovered, co-paid, uh, co-pays. On the governmental plans, the state employees pay $500 in a deductible and no co-pays, nothing more for insured expenses. The municipal employees pay 300. Same thing, no co-pays, nothing more. So 300 versus 1,000. And, and the state employees and the municipal employees aren't always subject to what are called benefit buy-downs. So when you're in a private insurance company's market, you work for an employer, here's what your employer does. The employer tells you that the premium is $10,000 for your family this year. And it was $10,000 last year. So we've held the cost of insurance flat. What they're not all that clear on telling you is that your copay is now $30 instead of $10 or that your deductible is now 3,000 instead of 2,500. That's called a benefit buy-down, and it means you get less insurance for the same premium, and that happens all the time. Um, when you're thinking about public employees and this pilot program, that, that political leadership could encourage to happen, you think, well, I'm not a public employee, so why does it affect me? You pay for the public employee's insurance, and you largely do it through your property taxes. And so this could be an opportunity for the political leadership to uplift local government rather than to downshift costs, which is what we do so much of. And if we combined, these programs, we could start talking about what universities like Stanford have discovered. Stanford and a number of other studies uh, have pinpointed, revealed that 5% of a group of insured people in a plan generate 50% of the medical costs. It's called the 550 dynamic. So if you focus your attention on that 5% that's the most costly, you can reap the largest benefits. And these public plans don't really do that. And again, political leadership could become involved to encourage that happening. So New Hampshire has 1.3 million uninsured. People without insurance has improved. There are fewer. I understand there are problems with the ACA. I agree with that. It's a 
flawed system. Um, but in 2013, before the ACA was adopted, 10.7% of New Hampshire people were uninsured. That's 100, 139,000. Now it's 5.9%. That's 76,000. That's as a result of Medicaid expansion, which has been adopted in, I think, 36 states. You'll be told that people who are on Medicaid, um, particularly in the expansion program, cost more, 24% more. That's because there's a pent-up demand. People who haven't had access to health care and are suddenly given health care have demands. And there are neighbors, there are brothers, there are sisters, there are cousins, and they deserve to get the care they need, and that demand will even out over time. So you shouldn't be put off by that. In New Hampshire, 13% uh, of the population receives Medicare. That's 169,000 people. In New Hampshire, the, the uh, trend of costs, the medical trend, what healthcare costs, like nationally, is largely driven by pharmacy increases and in particular, special kind of pharmacy increase. It's not the generics, it's the specialty drug costs that force the cost of Medicare, medical care upwards. Insurance companies negotiate their prices with employers, and if you're a good negotiator, your premiums don't go up as high. On the other side, they negotiate their prices with medical care providers and hospitals. I want, <clears throat> wanted to get a quick measure of this. So there's a New Hampshire Insurance Department calculator that tells you the cost of emergency room visits at the hospitals in the state. So let me just give you a couple of examples with my one minute left. Cheshire Medical Center, a medium complex, ER visit is $489, $489. Mananek Hospital is $517. Mary Hitchcock, $986. The swing in New Hampshire is Cottage Hospital, which I think is in Littleton, is the lowest at $347. Lakes Region Hospital is $2,003 for the same service. Medicare for all means one enterprise would be negotiating with each of those providers to get a fair cost for your care. Um, there's one last point I want to make, and, and that is the idea of reducing the age for accessing Medicare from 65 to 55. We have a uh, individual care market that's insured. Many people in that market get a subsidy. That subsidy covers all but 20,000 people. Those 20,000 people are generally self-employed older people. If we dropped the Medicare age as an interim step, I agree we need to do Medicare for all. But if that were an inter interim step, if that were a pilot in New Hampshire, we'd cover those 20,000 people. Thank you. Can you hear me? I'm Betty Keller from Vermont. You've been hearing what kind of a mess we're in and how we got here. But before I talk about some of the things you can do to get out of it, I would like to have some blood flow through your brain, which would involve moving a little bit. So anybody who's able to stand up is welcome to stand up now. And if you prefer to sit in your seats while you do some stretches, that's great. I'm going to set this down, and I'll just yell, OK? That's OK. They're not going to do it at home. So everybody, arms up. Reach with one arm, and then the other arm. Other arm, and the other arm. OK, I don't want you hitting anybody. So turn sideways and stretch your arms. And up. You're going to turn the other way. Turn the other neighbor and stretch your arms. And up. Good, OK. Now up on your toes. If you need to hold on to the seat in front of you, that's OK. And down. 
Keep your heels flat on the ground. Stretch the back of your ankles here. Okay, and up. Keep your head down. Lift it back up. Look up. Lift your chest up, up to the ceiling. And back down. Okay, if you can do this one, pick your knee up. If you, if you want to sit while you do that, you can, but just kind of stretch the back of your leg a little bit. Get that blood flowing, okay? Okay. Is blood flowing yet? <laughs> All right, thank you. Where's the remote? Oh, I can just push the button. Oh, maybe this is too tricky for me. Good evening. So I just put this slide on to tell you that it does matter that you land on fertile ground when you want to grow a movement. But um, I'm not going to talk very much about that because we don't have enough time. So you have to have some good seed, right, if you're going to grow something. I'd say that a healthcare movement might be more like an asparagus bed or trying to grow a tree. It takes a long time and there's a lot of work. You need to build your base. A lot of public ed education over a very long time through every imaginable means possible. Discussing what the problems are and what some of the possible solutions could be. And looking at what, how people solve these problems in other places. And you can't just transplant somebody else's solution to your place, but you can try to figure out how might that work here? How can we use something different where we are? Um, in Vermont, we have a strong town meeting culture. And the expectation at town meeting time is the legislators have a week off in the middle of their legislation, legislative session. They're supposed to come and listen to you, okay? So you give them your earful, okay? So there's lots of advocacy of citizens lobbying their legislature. So you need some water, organic fertilizer, sunshine, and time. We're in Vermont, there's not so much sunshine, you need a lot of time. We have a long history of advocacy. The Vermont legislature has been um, taking measures to address healthcare access and affordability since 1975. That means that we were working on this public education and advocacy long before that. By 1991, there was a bill by a couple of senators, so we're not talking just citizens begging and begging somebody to please co-sponsor something but a couple of legislators were on the health care committee and advocated strongly for a Canadian-style financing for health care. There was Sally Conrad and um, Cheryl Rivers. They couldn't get a third person on the committee to join them as a committee of five, so it didn't go anywhere. But they spent the entire summer, these two legislators, running around the state giving hearings and publicly edu you know, educating the public about why this would be a good idea and why they should tell their senators to vote for it. Um, in 2005, a bill for universal access to health care was passed by the House. It um, was watered down by the Senate and ultimately was still vetoed by the governor anyway. But, you know, this 2011 didn't just come out of the blue. There was a lot of years of advocacy going on. Along the way, we had incremental changes, little bandages put here and there. Principles were articulated to legislate in, in legislation as early as 2006. So when people talk about, oh, the Worker Center came and brought these principles, well, it was great that they marketed those principles, really made it more broadly um, understood and heard. But those were already being worked on long before they came on board. Um, and I know that you've had some people talk today in ways that might sound somewhat partisan, but it's really, really important to try to keep on bringing it back to being nonpartisan. It's not a partisan issue in these countries that have it. It's a human issue. And when the conversation starts to go partisan, try to bring people back and say, it's a human issue. So in addition to time, you need some sunshine. You need sunshine um, for trust. One of the big problems that we have with our current insurance system is that um, the insurance company's policies are entirely opaque and the prices of medical goods as we've spoken earlier today are opaque. And so people have the question, you know, am I getting what I'm paying for? 
If you have a government that you actually trust is of and by and for the people, and if you build transparency into the policy, then you'll have more trust than what we have right now. We can talk about the organic fertilizer a little bit. We had some homegrown and, and a transplant. Um, we had multi-issue organizations that allied together. Um, some have been active for very many years, but I'll also mention the ones that were more recent. Vermont Public Interest Research Group, VPIRG, you know, many states have a, a, a PIRG. The Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, League of Women Voters of Vermont, Vermont Psychiatric Association, Center for Independent Living, many groups recognized that they had many issues, but healthcare was a common issue that they had and they worked together. There were also some single issue allies. The Vermont Citizens Campaign for Health was incredible um, just across the border in the Brattleboro area. Richard Davis did so much education that made such a huge difference and that's one of the reasons that we had some of these legislators from um, the southern part of the state that came to Montpelier and tried to make a difference. Physicians for National Health Program um, did not have a local chapter still back in 2006, but um, many of these individual physicians were part of the national organization and they were out there doing Rotary Cub speeches like Marvin. Um, and then because of all the action happening here, there was this doctor in Buffalo, New York, who wasn't, she was spinning her wheels. She looked at a map to see where in the country might you actually get single payer at a state level. Deb Richter uh, moved to Vermont. And um, I'm going to show you a few of the slides with her, which was part of her action plan for how to, how to get things going. She had an 80-20 rule. Use 20% of your effort to get 80% of the result. I mean, she was a practicing physician as well, so she didn't have 100% time. But what time she had, she wanted to get a lot of bang for her buck. She focused on events where influential people were already collected and she didn't have to publicize the event. So she would ask Rotary Clubs if she could come speak to them. She would show up at town meetings or select board meetings, um, show up at uh, school board meetings, and when the, they're talking about the budget, um, you know, you're having to cut other places because that insurance is going up. You know what you could do instead, you know, talk to your legislators and get them to you know, do something more reasonable and more logical with your finances. Um, Rotary clubs are perfect, um, she said. Also you know, school board meetings, house parties, medical conferences. She focused on people that she considered influential and this is not a rights and democracy strategy but it takes all types to get there. So she was focusing on business people, health professionals, the religious community, school board and other town officials, labor and retirees. People who are organized and voting. She advocated listening for, um, figuring out who is your audience, listen to their concerns, address what's important to them. She would have three or four key features that she wanted to get across in all the different talks that she gave, but then she also had a couple points that were that were suited specifically for that group, things that they really cared about. Um, appealing to people's self-interest, she, she felt it was helpful. And avoiding the high moral ground, the moral high ground as being your only approach. That, that, that doesn't always persuade people who are very, very nervous or scared about something really different from what they're used to. In, and after all her talk about um, you know, meeting people in groups and getting the most bang for your buck, she also said, talking one-on-one -on -one is best. So staying after the meeting and being available. She was coming from out of state, so she had um, some basic strategies she had to figure out for herself. If you're not politically savvy here, but you want to become more active, this could be um, helpful instruction for you as well. Find your allies, get to know the political landscape, ask for advice, get referrals. So every time, she was networking all the time. Who are the powerful people? Listen, learn from others, and know your facts and share them. And be nonpartisan. She was really big on that. Now, in addition to the sunshine and the, and the fertilizer and all, you, you need water. Some basic issues that we had in Vermont still were that we needed to get the education spread further into the whole state. Um, and door to door, not just going to the Rotary Club wasn't going to do it. Do it. So um, it was not just those attending the hearings and, and reading the letters to the editor, but you had to get as many people as you possibly could. You needed to strengthen the foundation of the knowledge and skills and confidence of the advocates who were not um, necessarily as confident as, for instance, a doctor or a legislator might be. And you needed a broader range of legislators 
to hear support from their constituents, for them to be, feel comfortable. The Vermont Workers' Center became active in this topic in uh, 2008 and took these tasks on with their Healthcare as a Human Right campaign. They were training and empowering everyday Vermonters to share their stories, their values, to organize the movement, learning how to organize the movement, and to demand change. Um, the Vermont Workers' Center developed a framework of human rights principles with NESRI, the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative, by which to measure a piece of legislation. So, if you could look at a piece of legislation and say, these are the principles it has to meet, you could say, okay, this one's not good enough, we need to do something better. We need amendments, we need to strike, whatever we have to do, but this is not good enough. We also had to do some weeding. We had to change the narrative, and this was what the Vermont Workers' Center was big on, was changing the narrative from being politically impossible to support health care for all, instead to being politically impossible to oppose health care for all. So some of the strategies for doing this were to nurture your allies, to recruit new allies, to always be looking for common ground, and having a wide range of voices help legislators to hear better. So all these allies were trying to work together, the multi-issue allies and the single-issue allies. Working together makes you stronger. You need to listen to each other, respect everyone, whether you agree with them or not. And it's important to share your strategy with your close allies. Since you do have different issues, that you won't necessarily share everything, but especially um, if you're having some conflicts, sometimes there may feel like there are turf issues or fundraising conflicts. You're both trying to draw from the same donors, etc. I really urge you to discuss them and work out those conflicts so that you can get on the same page and work strongly together. If you all have the same mission, these turf battles shouldn't exist. You need to focus on synergy. In addition, if you have a strategy that seems a little controversial, if it's like really exciting and dramatic, but it might be offensive and you're not really sure, but you're, you know, you're feeling like really going for it, but you don't want to share it with your allies, mm, maybe you should be thinking about whether this is especially the time when you should be sharing it with your allies, especially if they might have longer years of experience and give some uh, input on a, a different path or some unintended consequences you might run into. Um, I'd recommend from our experience after passing the bill and then having our governor say, oops, don't think it's going to work after all. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, especially if that basket is a politician. <laughs> Keep multiple paths in mind and don't neglect opportunities on different paths. You know, if you have one person saying this is the way to do it and that's the only way, Keep on looking, are there ways to get around barriers? Are there barriers that they're ignoring or they're sure they can get over and you should be thinking about when we get to that barrier, what are we gonna do? And here's another one is always have an ask to keep up the momentum. Be anticipating the next step. So all you students, you might get asked this maybe if your teacher is here, I don't know. Top three, always look for common ground, listen, Listen to your allies, listen to everybody that you're talking with about why healthcare for all is so important, and maintain a nonpartisan stance. Thank you. Wow. That was a lot. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you again uh, to the panel. Um, I want to start off by giving you a quote on uh, this evening for us to really consider as we uh, continue our conversation. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. Yes, on the evening of his death, I wanted to invoke his words here as we continue this conversation about how can we, as a nation, call ourselves caring if we're not caring of the least of us. And so I think that we've heard a lot of information here. Um, I have all sorts of notes. I was planning to give a summary of what I heard 
But I think the one question that I had that really summed it up for me is, what are some of the underlying cultural values that we keep in the United States that keeps us from caring for each other? Really caring for each other in such a way that I understand that my reality is closely connected to yours. And if you are sick, so am I. If I am well, so are you. So I think that as I listen to everything of all of the things that I have in my iPad, I wasn't surfing the net, I was taking notes. Of all of the things that I have here, those are the things, that, those things resonated. What is it about us in this country that we don't feel like we could take care of each other and most of all understand how connected we are? So I don't want to continue. I want us to have an opportunity to, uh, for you to pose questions. If you are stuck, I have some questions. Uh, so never fear, we'll continue the conversation for about another 30 minutes, okay? So are there any questions? Uh, there's been a question hanging in the air for a while that has something to do with us being poised on the <laughs> brink of something. And I'd love to uh, hear more about that, please. The United States is gonna, about to enter a period of progressive change. And it's not gonna happen within the next 10 years, but it's not gonna be much longer than that. Uh, first of all, the political right has relied on racism and divisiveness, anti-immigrant, a lot of uh, divisive uh, strategies to try to get votes. But really, my optimism, oddly enough, comes from the king of divisiveness, the current president. Um, and I, understanding the coalition that brought Trump into office. and. Some portions of the coalition are not going to support progressive change. He's uh, the most worrisome uh, element of the Trump coalition are the racists, the bigots, the uh, white nationalists, the, all, all those fringe people who now feel empowered to talk. And they're a big problem for the country. And there's going to be a lot, there probably will be violence coming from that group. But it's really a small portion of his voters are actually people who would be that violent and nasty. So bigger portions of his coalition include ideologic, people who are ideologically opposed to government, and that may be as much as a quarter of the coalition. Other parts of the coalition that are the prominent people, the names you hear, are actually relatively small in number, the politicians and the super wealthy who fund them. So I'm gonna, all of those taken together are probably about 30 or at most a third or 35 percent of the Republican coalition. So let's look at the rest of them. And we need to talk to those people. And the two groups are uh, single issue voters, often evangelical people who are voting on abortion or uh, voting out of some uh, biblical ideas that you, it's evil to be gay or something like that. So, but I've, the abortion issue is really a very big one for that group, and it's a big group. It's probably 25 or 30 percent of the Republican coalition is focused on that. So I actually have three friends who are in that group who are voting on abortion because they're opposed to any, and they'll vote for any political party that will oppose abortion rights, the right to abortion. So I was asking, well, you're, you don't like the idea of killing a human, ending, a, killing a human life. But we know that for every 1,000 people who doesn't have health coverage, and then we know from this panel there's 28 million such people in the United States, we know for every 1,000 people who doesn't have health coverage, you can expect one extra death per year. So with 28 million people, you're talking about somewhere around 28,000 unnecessary deaths that wouldn't have happened in the United States if we had a semi-reasonable healthcare system. So I said, doesn't that bother you? 
And wouldn't you want to oppose, uh, support a political party that would want that? And she made an interesting answer. She said, well, I believe that social change actually has to come from, from religious belief, from personal charity. And I listened to that, and I, it, was, it sort of quieted me because it's very obvious that nothing will happen if we're going to wait for people to have religious conversions and suddenly be spending huge amounts of money on social welfare programs or getting an uninsured person who may need a big operation to get it. So I said, so what it, at the bottom line, if a political coalition came into office in the United States, w would you work to oppose universal health care? a healthcare system that included every single person. She said, no, I actually think that would be a good thing. She said, but I already told you I'm not going to vote for it. So I thought that was very interesting. So what, what I'm getting at is that you have about a third of the Republican coalition who are not going to oppose the vision of a humane healthcare system. And they really probably support it. And then the last third of the people are uh, sort of the Archie Bunker types, the people who don't want too much information. And I just want to look, and, and those were the, really the core of the enthusiasm in, uh, in the Trump voters, leaving aside the bigots and the, you know, the small group, smaller group of white nationalists and just the nasties. But this is a much larger group of people. They're not going to do anything violent. They're just, you know, they're not, not really paying that much attention to politics. And they just, they like the fact, two things that Trump said that were very important. When it came to health care, please remember you're, on the one side you had Obamacare, a very complicated piece of legislation with lots of co-pays and lots of deductibles and lots of complexity. That was the Democratic alternative spearheaded by Hillary Clinton. And a mandate. In a mandate, you had to buy health, and you'd get penalized money to, if you didn't like the insurance products in your area. So it was a weak piece of legislation. And then you had Donald Trump, who said, everybody will get health care if I'm president. <laughs> he said that. People ate it up. He said it over and over and over again. Everybody will get health care. People applauded. And what was the other thing Trump said? He said, the system is rigged against the little guy. And I'm going to be there for the little guy. I'm your, I'm your man. I'm not beholden to special interests. Well, I think the system is rigged. How many people here believe the system is kind of rigged against the little guy? Most people probably believe that. It is. It's rigged also against the middle class. And so what the progressive, so I think that 65 or so percent of the Trump coalition are people who are not married to an, any anti-government notion. They're just voting on guns or abortion, guns or abortion, or they're you know, religi religious fundamentalists. And they're Trump voters who are, could easily be won over by a system that says, this healthcare system is crap. It's complex. It's way, it costs way too much. I want a system that brings everyone in. I want a system that treats you the day you're sick, and it's there for your neighbor. Look down the street. Look at your neighbor. In one of those houses, somebody in one of those houses, if your street has 15 houses on it, somebody's really getting screwed by the health care system. This has got to stop. And, and we have to go beyond, get beyond the notion that the, a Republican Party that's basically relying on division and racism and anti-xenophobia, anti-immigrant sentiment, and put out a vision that insists on saying everyone is in. Everyone. Even the white middle class, even all the elements, that everyone will get health care. That you don't have to be in some entitlement. You don't have to be poor to get health care. That really universal health care is a middle class program, in a sense. Because all of the proposals that we all, the system we have still does take care of the very poorest people. It's the middle class that goes bankrupt from health care costs. This is a middle class proposal. We're going to be there for you. You're not going to have to worry about $10,000 deductibles and bills coming in when your wife has cancer. 
It's going to be there for you. And look at the international experience. It's less expensive. So I'm, I'm optimistic. So that's the Republican side. And the Democrat side is basically very, very favorable to single-payer universal health care. 80% at least of Democrats would support it if it were enacted. So I think there's lots of reason to be optimistic. The, the coming progressive coalition comes from the fact that young people are not going to put up with this crap anymore. They're insisting on progressive change. They're, they're, learning, they're learning from what the NRA has done, is, but that's just one example. And I think in coalition with this country is increasingly minority, and, and I think we've found that right-wing politics, politics has been dependent on disenfranchising and disempowering minorities and all of them, I mean, whether they're Latino, whether they're black, whether they're any minority, every single one of them is now singled out as anathema by the, by the political right in this country. So the thing is that they're becoming a majority. So more and more states are going to tend to vote progressive. But I think they'll only do it if we have solid proposals I think this that is we a all filibuster. Like and not compromise stuff. <laughs> Can I just make a quick comment? I promise I won't go on as long. I, I, there's one point you have to make. That point is that healthcare is not a finite resource. And until you convince people that one person can have it and the other person still can have access to good health care, the first person won't let his hand off the dollar. And so that's got to be part of the conversation. I, I agree 100% with all the coalition building and the importance of young people, but the message has to be clear and it has to be succinct and that there's enough in this country for all of us. I, I had a, a nuts and bolts question. Um, like I also think in the history of, of Healthcare in this country that that the uh, private insurance uh, was sort of a, a mistake, an accident that happened as a different way of paying when there was uh, no uh, during war during World War II you couldn't increase income, you couldn't increase wages, but you could give health care. So I I I think what. Uh, a big question that I have, and I, I'm really pretty well versed in, in this stuff, is what would the Medicare premium increase to if you included all in uh, Medicare for all program? Because when I'm talking to people, that's, that would be the seller right there. It would be, okay, you can stop your $1,000 a month private insurance payment and your health care would be included in Medicare for all by this percentage, it would just be a good thing to know. You, you, you bring up a variety of interesting issues. Um, you speak back to the 1940s and 50s. Remember, in those days, there was something called non-for-profit Blue Cross Blue Shield. Do you know where this started? Texas, Baylor in Texas. It was a community program in 1929 to develop a coverage for the employers at the hospital, then the community, and then it spread like wildfire. What a great idea. And again, in those days, as, as Marvin said, hospitals really didn't assume as much responsibility for health as it does today. But even despite that, this nonprofit, community-based organization called Blue Cross Blue Shield is what served employers in the United States really until the 1980s. 1980s, we saw what, I, I came to New Hampshire to work for a PINKO organization called a, a non-for-profit HMO, like Kaiser, and this is Matthew Thornton Health Plan, founded by idealistic docs who wanted to actually have a um, program of physicians who um, provided care in this fashion. Half the hospital left when we set up this HMO, this PINKO organization in the town of Nashua. Well, that became for profit. That was some of the first for profits. And in fact, what happened to HMOs was people started feeling triage, they started having their care go towards organizational profit. 
A Blue Cross Blue Shield became for profit in 1992. Anthem or other similar spin offs, they are actually now competing with the large for profit organizations. So the landscape of healthcare for the non Medicare population changed dramatically. Premiums, deductibles, out of pocket costs. Uh, that's an important take home point. Employers worked with non for profit organizations for many, many years back when they were large organizations. So when there was US Steel and GM and the big three, everyone worked for, throughout a lifetime and had this relationship with their employer. So that history that you remember, has, the landscape has totally changed now. And, and as folks have mentioned up on this panel, the other aspect of changing landscape is how many folks are falling between the cracks. They are not poor enough to be el eligible for Medi Medicaid even in expanded Medicaid states like New Hampshire, and they're not wealthy enough to be able to afford insurance, uh, and they're not employed by an employer who can cover them with these large organizations. And in this gig economy, there's a lot of New Hampshireites who are entrepreneurs or, or small business people, uh, and I think those numbers um, don't necessarily tell that story. So your question is, what do premiums look like? Well, I have that written down here somewhere. So there's, there, by the way, there's a couple of um, proposals in Congress. Annie Custer did propose bringing Medicare back to age uh, 50, 55, which would cover a lot of these issues, by the way, folks who have increasing medical costs. Um, Jean Shaheen has signed on to Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All in the Senate side of things. There are about 180 sponsors in the U.S. National Senate, uh, sorry, uh, House of Representatives for what's called 676 which was one of the earliest um, uh, programs to develop a single payer, uh, essentially expanded Medicare for all. And that would basically mean, t if so, uh, and that was uh, proposed in 2003. Uh, um, and uh, it's now, uh, Keith Ellison is now spearheading that. Uh, Conyers is no longer in the House of Representatives for other reasons, but uh, that was uh, his baby from way back when. So anyhow, 676 in terms of financing, proposes maintaining current federal financing as it is, increasing personal income taxes on the top 5% of income earners. One of the things about financing for healthcare in the US is it is not progressive. It's, it's never made any sense. It's not based on income unless you are very poor or uh, if you're very wealthy, you get a, uh, you know, a Cadillac uh, uh, taxes and the like. So basically, they're going to increase, with this particular plan, increase personal income taxes, top 5%, institute a tax of 0.5% on stock trades, and 0.01% tax on the maturity of bonds, and essentially uh, fixed uh, swaps and trades. There would be a 6% high income surtax for families making more than $225,000. So it's a tax program, basically for those who can pay for it. As to, and, and it would also tax capital gains, dividends, and, and uh, other issues. The payroll tax would increase. It would need to be increased to cover a whole slew of things that are not currently covered, including unemployed, uh, and, and I'm sorry, include un, uninsured and the American population. So it'd have to be a 6% payroll tax that would be uh, added to the top 60% of income earners, and a 3% payroll tax on the bottom 40% of income earners. Um, and there would also, interestingly, there would be cost controls. One of the problems with pricing failure in the U.S. is not just because of the monies that go into the stock market to um, chase the profit of the insurance companies. It's also we don't have any control on the cost of what things are for services in the United States. So H.R. 676, as Bernie Sanders' legislation proposed on the other side of things, would have negotiated fees, global budgets, uh, con constraints on capital planning, and the like. Um, so um, I, I think that um, these, the other issues to bear in mind, a lot of current taxes, for instance, HSAs, health savings accounts, um, a variety of other things would go away. Workers' comp would go away. Uh, and so there's tax free or tax supported programs for the middle class that would no longer, those revenues would go back to the, to the government because they're no longer necessary. So a variety of other programs that would be eliminated because they're no longer necessary with a, with a single payer program of this nature or expanded Medicare. 
uh, the overall uh, in, increase in, in, in Medicare would actually be minimal because it would be covered by the payroll taxes and, and uh, uh, the wealthy. So Medicare right now has payroll tax 2.9%. Yep. Six percent for the top six percent of income earners, three percent for the bottom forty percent. By the way, no matter how we discuss this, if it comes to pass, it's going to look a lot different. So once that meat grinder puts the sausage out, it's going to look terribly different from, the, from any of these proposals. Other things you could speculate on. You can have a cert, a cert the various cert taxes you could apply, excise taxes on cigarettes could go to the federal government, adding 50% to cover everybody's insurance. You could have uh, sugar drinks, um, you know, one cent per ounce of uh, sugar. Th there's a thousand different ways to fund it, but they should be progressive, equitable, and, and, and appropriate to the need. Um. So that's, did everybody get what he said? That was actually really important, and I encourage you all to look this up. Uh, look up the Conyers bill or Bernie Sanders bill, which is this, the similar bill on the Senate side. But one thing that Ken didn't mention just now, he knows it, but he didn't mention it, was that the health care system, the other part of funding is out-of-pocket payments. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank and you. very important. So, yes, people in the lower 40% of income would have a 3% payroll tax, but then and the other people, wealthier people would have 6% payroll tax, but there wouldn't be $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 deductibles. There wouldn't be co-pays like they are now. So those who use the health care system will no longer be getting those letters saying denied, coverage denied, here's your bill. We would have an end to medical bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. That's right. important all, to think about. They're I don't think any minimal. Have They're actually very minimal. No, very little. No, some Taiwan, no Brit Britain and Canada have no co-pays or deductibles. Taiwan has very small co-pays. It varies by country. Switzerland has the highest amount of co-pays. So it's, they're actually minimal. There's no med essentially no medical bankruptcy in other countries. Right. Sure. And we, should, and we should get back to deductibles, but what, what you, thank you for bringing that up. The average American would save thousands of dollars because of the cut to, to their out-of-pocket costs primarily. Yeah. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at a meeting, and it's not due to health care, but I want to tie it into what I, I have a question for you. Uh, and it came up with talking about protecting anything to do with the environment. And one of the New Hampshire state reps, wasn't my rep, but one of the state reps said, well, we'll deal with democracy later, deal with the uh, climate now. So it ties to my question. I'm very concerned about the changes that are being looked at in Washington, D.C., cuts to Medicare and Medicaid. If those cuts happen, how many years is it going to take to re just getting back those misled steps that are going to happen to seniors, those who are on uh, Medicare. So if we look too much, um, looking ahead and not seeing what's happening right in, in our uh, closets at this time, is now the talk in Washington is to have whatever's coming in to f uh, pay for the federal government is what will go out and there will be drastic cuts to uh, Medicare and uh, Medicaid with that program if it happens. Your, your comment about what happens in Washington is of interest. They, they recently initiated this Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, as you know, uh, last November. So there was a huge uh, giveaway to the very wealthy and a drop in corporate taxes from 35% to 21%. So a lot of people are speculating, well, they will use that, of course, to cut basic services, to cut back on necessities such as Social Security and Medicare and, uh, and uh, the federal contribution to Medicaid. It could be a blessing in disguise because those cuts can be reinstituted if targeted towards a national health program. Uh, in other words, there's now discrete um, amounts of monies that have been eliminated because of that bill. If you think that many of these um, legislative proposals 
are going to be offering this service to the nation as a whole if, in fact, um, there's a blue tie that comes in over the course of the next four years. Those could be reinstituted but targeted towards particular services to the, to the country uh, and when people recognize what. It, it's, it's, it's a hopeful if, no, no question. By the way, and I, th it's, I think it's very important, and I'd love to hear some questions from the students, by the way, but somebody did mention deductibles, and, and you were talking about the fact that many other nations who have done this for years, they've figured it out, really don't have a lot of co-pays. They don't have a lot of deductibles. In the U.S., when, or, or no, no, no deductibles at all, no rarely co-pays. And no co-insurance. Very, very rarely. In, in the U.S., when deductibles are instituted as an incentive for people to spend less on medical care, the whole theory was, oh, I'm going to make it more expensive so they're not going to get anything back from... Do, do the students know what, in, what deductibles are? Do you know what... The, we talked about this earlier. Do you have an, an idea about it? Okay. If you have to pay $3,000 before your insurance company that you've been paying premiums to for the past 10 years was going to pay for your surgical procedure, how would you approach that? So you've been paying $10,000 a year to, your, to Anthem or whomever you want. You have a medical need that's ar arisen. I've got to pay $3,000 for this. How do you approach that? Are you going to shop around? So that was the theory. The theory was, ah, the free market will allow people, they're going to go price out the cost of removing uh, the cyst from this hospital, that hospital, that hospital. It doesn't work that way. People forego care. Yes, there is about a 10% drop in the amount of cost of medical care when people have deductibles, but it's not because they shopped around or got more effective or more higher value care. They, for, they went without it. And, that, and that's why a lot of other countries have had this experience. They do not have deductibles. And copays basically serve the same purpose. It's a very minimal and perverse incentive. It doesn't work. We have time for one more short question. Hopefully this is a short question. <laughs> I was wondering if um, we could hear more about the um, experience in Vermont, um, and specifically um, after um, Governor Shumlin, um, or I think that's his name, um, didn't pass the act that people were looking for. So in, um, in 2011, I guess, we passed the bill, Act 48, and the plan then was to get the financing plan, and then we had the election. Um, five Democrats were in the primary fighting against each other about who would be most supportive of a health care plan. Um, and, uh, and then when the financing plan that um, when the financing plan was presented to Shumlin, Governor Shumlin, he looked out over and said, "Oh, I can't really." ask the state to do that. And there's a lot of um, guessing about what was suddenly the difference. But um, it's, it's really hard for a single small state. We have a lot of borders around us. If you were a larger state, then you'd have more population. And every border, you have people who are crossing to go get health care at Dartmouth, or people who are coming um, going over to have their job over there and their insurance might be with that instead. And there's just so many factors around those, those borders. It's one of the issues around having a single state do something, and especially a small state with not a lot of population that has a lot of borders. Um, so th that was one of the, the big problems with it, that some of us weren't sure it would work anyway, and then we were really kind of disgusted with how that ended. And we were very discouraged, and there were other issues that happened at that time, but basically Physicians for National Health program in Vermont decided to focus on moving forward, educating more, getting some um, medical students trained as interns to study this kind of policy stuff in depth for five weeks and then go out to their medical schools and, um, and in their residency programs afterwards and with their colleagues to continue the education and advocacy. 
I want, I want one more part of the answer. I think the question was why was the plan withdrawn and not implemented? Is that correct? So the, uh, one of the most important aspects of that that didn't get, I have issues with state-based reform. We've got all these borders. We're a very small state. We have no power to negotiate with the pharmaceutical industry. And I know Betty's been very active to try to develop a multi-state coalition that would be in a position to negotiate with the pharmaceutical industry. But a big event that got no publicity that occurred in 2012, the year after it, the reform was passed, was that people who were going to be implementing the reform from Vermont went to Washington. And they got a complete no when they said, we want to bring everyone, all the federal postal workers, all the federal employees, all Medicare, send us a fixed amount of money just the way you're doing with the private insurance companies that are picking off elderly people called the Medicare Advantage plans. So you can do it for them, you can do it for us really easily, and the difference is that we're not gonna pick out the healthy people to insure. We're gonna insure every single person that's currently insured through the Medicare program. And it would have been very easy to implement. They could have done it with the federal employees and everyone else insured through the federal government. They completely stonewalled it, said no, there were a lot of reasons for that, but it, it really meant that administratively the plan would be complex. And so we, we lost the opportunity to at least get rid of a lot of the administrative costs there. And I also have quibbles with the people who were appointed to the board because they could have done more things to reduce administrative costs in other ways. I think it's, when I talk about having a su potentially successful program to implement, I have a much easier time arguing it at the federal level. It would be so simple, exactly what Ken said in terms of financing. It's, it would be extremely popular. There's no reason that you wouldn't have a broad-based coalition, whereas these state-based reforms have much more trouble controlling costs for all the reasons we've talked about. Well, we've reached that point. Um, let's give the a panel another <laughs> round of applause. Thank you. So my name is Jesse. I'm with the group that organized this. And I'd like to talk about a next step, if I can get anybody involved that I haven't talked to already. Uh, some coalition building. And what Dr. Keller said, a key word that I want to pick up on was synergy. <clears throat> there are a lot of resources in our town. If we work together, to create what's called social capital, which I would define as the, uh, the spirit that comes from the, based on the values that we have in community, like volunteering could contribute a great deal of help, a lot of resources for people who have unmet needs. Okay, so resources is a, a euphemism for people who don't like to talk about money, say the word money. But it also means efforts, time, contribution, citizenship. These are resources. And, and I'm concerned about poverty. I don't think it's a word that, that really came up, even though 50 years ago, Dr. King called for a guaranteed livable income 50 years ago. Well, it was one idea that it was really, really important to realize how much desperation, fear, and depression and mental health problems come from poverty. Would you agree? I mean, do you think that's what's at the root of a lot of mental health? Do you think poverty is at the root of what causes our health care costs to rise? Anybody? So you got poverty on the one hand, you got high costs on the other, but yeah. How many believe poverty is man-made and can be fixed? Wow, all right, good. Well, let me fine tune that poverty is about not meeting 
your personal needs. And social service helps that by assisting people so they know what they need. Because when you lose your strengths, you lose track of that. You can't even identify, let alone how to pull yourself up. They help you with more that you can do, how to find options, how to discover your inner resources. Uh, and they know you need to be affirmed, not denied. Examples of how social capital delivers relationships are like the time trade, the why, co-ops, recovery centers. I think we could have a coalition of people that are already involved in healthcare and shift it toward emphasizing that what we would do is help self-care grow. Helping people meet needs, meaning resources, and lowering poverty because they're self-actualizing a little bit more. Lowering fear, lowering depressions, raising mental health and productivity and creativity. Because physical health depends a lot on emotional health and spiritual health, and we can do something about that. So please, if you have any interest in this, come and tell me. We're gonna have meetings. We're gonna create public meetings. And I have an outline that we need to then fill in a little bit with your own ideas. And I hope to see somebody's interested. Thanks. Hi, my name is Amy Hathaway. I'm a co-founder of Monadnock Progressive Alliance. I'm not the picture of health tonight. I apologize for my voice. Um, but I just wanted to give a plug for um, checking out Monadnock Progressive Alliance website. We have several different working groups. We started in, the De in December of 2016 and have grown to work on various different issues um, with a uh, focus on education and racial justice, et cetera, and obviously health care, among other things. Um, so we'd like to really give you a plug to please join our health care team. We're going strong and continuing to uh, build our, our power here in the state as well as with Rights and Democracy New Hampshire. Um, and please check out their healthcare justice team. Kathy Staub is here um, and able to answer some questions and has some petitions as well, I believe. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, and also just to give a quick plug that um, Heather Stockwell is in the back and doing, uh, getting people to fill out the right, uh, Grassroots Democracy Initiative survey. Um, if you got one filled out, that would be great. Make sure you turn it into Heather. Um, I think that's it, and please join us. Thank you very much. Oh, the healthcare rally, thank you. <laughs> How could I forget? Um, Saturday from 11 to 1, we'll be on the Central Square um, joining a bunch of people together to uh, promote health care in, in the state and across the country, obviously. So join us on Saturday at 11. Thank you. <laughs>